With all these transport processes, with these species, trying to describe the binding and transport properties and developing test methods for some of them. And on the other side, to the right, we try to describe and quantify these transport processes in structures. Uh, of course, and when you do that, you need to know the boundary conditions what are actually the climate, climatic conditions, the environmental actions on your surfaces of your concrete structures. Uh, and then, of course, on models, to build models on how, what, what are the transport processes actually in, in reality, and verify that against field exposures. And, and uh, we had a number of projects here. Someone, somebody, uh, usually a PhD student had a, a small portion of this, sometimes very wide, sometimes a very small portion of it. And for instance, I have just one example here on microclimate at surfaces. We had one student working on that, only that portion. And, and that was actually starting with, uh, within a European project with the coordinator here in, in the Netherlands. That's the project called Duracrete. Maybe some of you have heard about it. And I had a PhD student working on environmental actions at concrete surfaces. And one thing he did was to expose concrete specimens from the same batch, from the same batch, all over Europe. Because we had no data at all. Because it seems as if every researcher used only his concrete, and put it in his waters, in the backyard. And we had no literature data at all where we had the same concrete in two different waters. It didn't exist. So what he did here, he was very f uh, keen on driving. So he drove around Europe with the specimens in the back. I had to go there first, of course, to negotiate about uh, using the exposure sites from different uh, laboratories. And I, I like that very much. And you can see here where we went. Uh, we, didn't went to, we didn't go to Dubai and Tasmania. We could use the, the, the um, UPS service for that. But you can see here where we were in, in the Mediterranean, in the Atlantic Ocean, up north, where the water is very cold and in the Baltic Sea where we have a very low salinity and so on. And, and he could see what, what are the parameters that are actually decisive for environmental actions. So that's just one example of, of, of studies we made. So uh, I, will, I will talk a little bit about um, transport processes today. First about the significance of them and then about the mechanisms involved in different transport processes and how we describe them when we are making models. Um, you have got some papers in your binder, and you got it now, um, I think, with the, the, the figures in, uh, in colors. And uh, there is one correction to be made already now, because I saw that Meta was referring to some of the work, and it's not correct in the paper you got here. Let me see if I can find the, the cursor. There it is. Um, well, I, I just say that, well, having been around for some time, I have made a lot of mistakes. And, and uh, uh, well, it's easy to, to think that you have to do all these mistakes yourself by trying. Um, but um, if you're lucky, you notice yourself that you actually made a mistake, so you, you repeat what you try to do. Sometimes you do not realize that until you have already published what you did. And um, then you realize that it was a mistake. And what do you do then? How do you correct an old paper? How do you do that? It's not easy, because that old paper is there in an old magazine, and people who read it do not know that, well, it's corrected later on somewhere else. 
that's, that's a problem. And I have two examples here. Our first paper, our very first paper on chloral ingress included a very nice method to measure chloral ingress. And you saw that yesterday at Intron, that method. But at the end of that paper, we also had a discussion on why the two diff diffusion coefficients we measured were different. And by then, we didn't understand that they should be different. We just saw from the result that they were different, but we had no idea why. Nowadays, we know why. We even know the relationships between them, but we didn't at that time. And I don't know how to correct that. That's something you have to live with. The other example was shown by, well, not shown, but you refer to it, Matt. You showed this picture. The temperature dependence of the sorption isotherm uh, is there. It's difficult to measure. It's almost impossible to measure if you measure it directly as a sorption isotherm. So what we are doing is actually to measure, we are measuring the distance between the two curves, like this. The horizontal distance between the two curves. We are measuring the RH difference instead of trying to measure the difference in moisture content, because that is very difficult to measure that precise. But it's very much easier to measure the RH difference precise. We did that. And in your, this paper you got in the binder, looking like this, figure three there is seen like this. And this is only a couple of years ago. And today we know that this, is not, this curve is not correct. So I would like you to, to make a cross over that figure and, and say, say that, uh, well, it should look like this instead. So this is the new figure. The same one, more or less, the same, well, the same data is included. But back then, we didn't have more than this data here. So we draw a curve through the data. We didn't realize by then that the, we have one group here with a certain water cement ratio and the same water cement ratio here. And then we had another group of data here with another water cement ratio. But later measurements show that there is a significant water cement ratio dependence in this picture. So that's why it should look like this with a very clear dependence of the water cement ratio. And I can give you uh, this um, picture in the handouts. Meta will get it. And you can notice here, of course, you, it's very peculiar because the, 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 the data here says it's, it's below zero here. For the higher water cement ratios, it's below zero. This, the distance between the desorption isotherms. We try, well, that's peculiar. We try to measure it again and again and again. We get the same results. We have an idea of why, but we haven't proven it yet. So maybe you, some of you could do that, hopefully. Okay, that's it. That's about corrections. Okay, as I said, I, I would like to start with a few words about what is the significance of transport processes in cementitious materials. And when I'm talking about transport processes, I'm referring to, for instance, these ones here. A transport process could be, at the top here, something penetrating into a, a concrete, or something being absorbed by concrete or something may, may be even penetrating through a piece of concrete, a concrete structure or a specimen. That's also a, another kind of a transport process. A transport process could also be this one, where something is going out of a concrete because of drying, because of leaching, or, and of course, when doing so, emit something from the concrete to the environment, to the surrounding waters or to the surrounding air. 
and maybe some, sometimes you're interested about the emissions and not necessarily what happens inside the concrete. So when studying emissions from concrete structures, you are very interested in transport processes. In some cases, you have variations like this, where something is going in and out because of the boundary conditions varying. Obviously, if the temperature varies, the humidity varies, if you have wetting and drying and so on, this is the kind of transport processes you get. And they can all more or less be described with the same transport properties. It's the same transport properties involved. The differences here are more or less the boundary conditions. So if you have the transport properties of your concrete for your particular species, you could, you could actually simulate, predict these, these kinds of transport processes. Well, about the significance. Well, of course, ingress is a transport process, but also in a number of applications where you have a redistribution of things. To get a certain kind of deterioration, you need species already in the concrete to redistribute, meet each other and so on. And that takes a transport process. And it's the transport process that decides the time needed for a deterioration to happen. Almost all, you, you, you could hardly find a deterioration process where the transport processes are not involved or, uh, and, and even uh, decisive. And of course the time, if you want to know the time, for instance the service life or the time to, to do something, to dry or to get a certain amount and so on, if you want the time, you need to quantify a transport process. And this is not always acknowledged. I have some examples. You learned yesterday that corrosion is the major problem we have with deterioration, limiting the service life of concrete structures. And this is one example where a steel bar, once the size of a finger, today is only a, a thread because of corrosion. And corrosion happens because of uh, the corrosion be being initiated by carbonation or chloride ingress. And the propagation when the corrosion happens needs some electrical conduction. You need to be able to transport electricity, which means that ions should be able to move. Um, or perhaps, um, and also you need diffusion of oxygen to the cathode in a corrosion process. So if that is stopped, the corrosion will stop or at least be, be uh, very much slower. And this is the kind of uh, service life model we have. And you also saw that picture yesterday. And I think Meta sh uh, showed it as well. This is a service life model invented a long time ago, uh, mainly on reinforcement corrosion, but it's also applicable for most other deterioration processes where you have an initiation period where no damage occur. And then you have a propagation period where the, you can measure and you can see the damage. And, and uh, usually when we are doing service life design, we, we limit the service life to this point here, where the inis initiation period is, is uh, come to an end. And for reinforcement corrosion, that is simply two transport processes giving that time, the carbonation and the chloride ingress to the steel. For instance, carbonation, you have a lot of things happening during carbonation. Here you have a steel bar, you have the concrete surface, you have this concrete cover, and in this concrete cover, Carbonation happens because of the gas, CO2, penetrates by simple diffusion. It's a simple diffusion process. And of course, it cannot penetrate further until it has reacted with the calcium oxide being present at all depths. So this will be a very slow process, of course. And um, 
what happens here is that this diffusion process of carbon dioxide, a gas, will be slowed down because of moisture in the pore system. So if you have very wet conditions at, as at the top here, this process will be very slow. That would be in winter time or after rain and so on. But in summertime, you will have a moisture profile looking like this. And of course, the diffusion process for a gas is much quicker. And this is the, the thing you have to consider when you're trying to model carbonation, to actually describe this transport process during wetting and drying. With the further deep, or the deeper you go in, the smaller is the, the um, variation in moisture conditions. Then what is not shown here is also that the, the carbonation react, reaction itself, the CO2 plus calcium oxide, is also dependent on the moisture conditions. So if it's too dry, not as much of the calcium oxide will react with the, with the CO2. And this is something we study today when it's suddenly become of interest to study carbonation in indoor structures, where it never was any, of any interest at all, because we had no corrosion there. But today, uh, you want to know the absorption of carbon dioxide by concrete structures, and then you, you need to, to realize that most of the absorption of CO2 of concrete structures you find indoors. And then we didn't know anything about the carbonation reaction, or very little at least. The other mechanism that can initiate corrosion is the chloride ingress, also a transport process. And this is, you could say, much more complicated and not so well understood uh, even, even today, where you have a concrete surface with some exposed to some chlorine environment from the sea or the icing salts, penetrating in a completely different way into, into um, uh, the steel and eventually reaching a certain limit here called the threshold level. And that is when you, when you pass that, you initiate reinforcement corrosion because of chloral ingress. And this is, and now it's ions that move. And ions, we say, can't fly, so they must move in water. So you have to have a wet pore system. And maybe uh, if you have wetting and drying, you can move the ions with the water as well. So you have convection in certain environments convection of the ions with the water. One example of, of a, a complicated transport system where you have ions is when concrete surfaces are exposed to de-icing salts. During a winter, every time you're salting, you get a dissolution of the, of the uh, salt solution. You're starting with a very saturated solution uh, and then eventually when you melt more and more ice, you get uh, a smaller and smaller, a lower and lower concentration. And that means that you have a severe exposure to the surface, and that will increase your chloride concentration at the surface during your winter. These are measurements uh, once every month during a winter. And then after the winter, when you do not use uh, the icing salts anymore, you have a lot of rain during the summer. You might have a lot of rain during the fall. And that will, of course, also act on the concrete surface, diluting and leaching out some of the chlorides. And for, in some cases, almost all of the chlorides that penetrate during the winter. So after a, win after a summer and a fall, you will see this chloride profile, where you have seen that the concentration at the very surface is almost zero, demonstrating that the, the binding process of chloride is almost reversible. You can leach it all out again. But what's already there can continue to transport, be transported further into larger depths. And depending on your concrete, you can get a balance where you have 
more and more accumulating every year, or you can find a balance where you're actually stopping the, the further penetration and what is uh, going in one winter is going out during the summer and, and fall. When it comes to corrosion rates, we have a fairly complicated system of transfer processes shown in this picture as one example. This is the relative humidity of the concrete and this is the corrosion rate measured as the corrosion current. And you can see here that the, this is a log scale here. You can see a jump here around 85% RH where the corrosion rate increases a lot, one or two orders of magnitude. And then you pass a peak and then you're getting very close to 100% RH, close to saturation, you have a drop in corrosion rate. And that could be because of two contradicting transport processes. One is the electrical conductivity that needs some moisture to actually be able to transport any electricity at all. So you have to have an electrical current between the anode and the cathode. And if it's too dry, this conductivity is simply too small. Maybe not zero, but, but very small. Uh, and increasing with the humidity. But if you are too close to saturation, the oxygen to the cathode will have difficulties in reaching in. So you, that will be a limiting factor. If you add these two together, you will have this peak somewhere above 90% RH. A very small, very tiny window, so to speak, where you can actually get significant corrosion in, in, uh, in concrete. What about sulfate attack? Um, we haven't talked very much about that previously, but uh, did you talk anything about that, uh, Carol? No? Well, sulfate attack is happening because of different, well, well because of different reasons. One reason would be uh, one of the clinker components in cement uh, to react with sulfate, because sulfate is, is uh, penetrating from the surroundings. Or perhaps you could have a reaction because of, of the sulfates already in, in, the, in the binder as uh, a gypsum. Uh, and the, the, the reaction product would be ettringite, which includes a lot of water, a lot of water. I think it's 31 or 32 molecules of water per molecule of ettringite. So you cause a lot of expansion because of that. But my question is, of course, where did the water come from? Because that water, all that water is not present from the beginning. It's not there. So get expansion needs, you have to move the water. And if water has to move from the surroundings into your reaction sites, that would take time. Or if you need the water, or you can use the water already in the concrete, it has to be redistributed. So if it is there, it's not enough where ettringite is formed. So you need to have some moisture transport or water transport. And we have seen this in a couple of cases where it takes years, it could take five years for water to penetrate enough into a structure like this. This is a tiny um, concrete sleepers for a railway where you have a very dense concrete and you have something called delayed ettringite formation. Uh, the ettringite didn't form early as it should, so it formed later on, and then when the water gets in, you get this terrible expansion causing cracks. But you need this transport process to get the damage, the water transported into the reaction sites, and that is what takes time to get the damage. Uh, another 
an example of deterioration is alkali aggregate reactions, where reactive aggregates react with the alkalis in the, the binder. You know, we have a very high pH in, in concrete, could be up to 14, usually above 13.5 or something like that. And some aggregates is not inert enough to, to res resist that, but can react with the alkalis, forming a gel that will absorb water. And that means that you, you need a couple of transport processes here. The alkali and the reactive aggregates must meet. Of course, the aggregate doesn't move, so the alkalis must move to the aggregate. That needs a certain humidity in the pore system. If not, the alkalis cannot come in contact with the reactive aggregate. And once you have the gel, the, re the reaction product, you need water to get it to expand. And that will also take time and a significant humidity to, to get to uh, an expansion. This is one example. This is, from a, this is the end of a concrete beam that is uh, severely cracked because the core of it has expanded because of alkali aggregate reactions. They haven't even tried to, to repair the cracks by epoxy, but it didn't help because there is not enough water coming in and further expansion occurs, so the repair material also cracked. And once you have it, it's not easy to do something. You already have the alkali, you have the aggregate, you obviously have the pessimum conditions, so there's only one thing you could do, and that is to remove the moisture. And that is what they try to do in this case. They put a roof on top of this beam with an air gap in between to get some ventilation and try to dry the beam. It didn't help. You cannot dry a, a, a large member of concrete like that. But the technique has been used, for instance, for on facades where you have thinner concrete elements and you are using hydrophobic agents to get, well, to prevent the, the uh, rainwater to get in. And in that way, you can actually reduce the, the uh, moisture content and in that way also reduce the expansion. There is also here a very small window where these kind of reactions can give you damage. And this small window is somewhere between 85% RH and 100% RH, where you have the alkali transport here being one limiting factor. If you have a lower humidity, you will not have any transport of alkalis. And if you have two wet conditions, in some cases, the gel that is formed is too fluid, so it will penetrate the pore system instead of causing any pressure. So that is a, a strange type of transport process, but it, it could be limiting the, the damage. What about frost damage? Will that be, are there any transport processes involved in frost damage? Well, obviously, water has to come into the concrete to, to, get any, to give any frost damage at all. But we try to prevent that by using, as Matthew told you about, the, the uh, air voids that we on purpose put into the concrete to get a frost-resistant concrete. The, the air voids can then be expansion sites where the, the ice can go in during freezing and then give out again so you have some expansion volumes for the expansion when water freezes. But of course these air voids could be filled with water eventually. It could take a week, it could take a hundred years, depending on how you design your air void system. And the process filling these air voids is very complicated because to get water into the air voids, you have to get rid of the air first. And the air is entrapped, surrounded by water. So it's not, not easy to get the, the air out because it has to go out through water. The air has to be dissolved in the pore water and as dissolved, diffuse through the, the water in the pore system and escape from the concrete or escape to 
to a larger airboat. And that is a very slow transport process. It could easily take a hundred years for that process to, to eventually fill the airboats. So we can decide a frost resistant concrete by well, designing this transport process. Frost damage could look like this, uh, with scaling at the surface, or it could also be expansion in, inside the, the concrete. And here we can, we can define a very precise moisture content called the critical degree of saturation. Below that, if you have a pore system that is not filled up to this point, concrete can withstand any freezing, no problems, no damage at all. If you just pass this critical degree of saturation a little, only one frost cycle will damage your concrete. And of course, if you have more frost cycles, you can damage more and more of the volume of the concrete and you can, you can get severe damage. And this is a, a, a parameter that is given by the average system, you could say. And we, can, we have methods to measure that critical degree of saturation fairly precise. So if we just know the airboy system, it would be possible to actually predict the, the critical degree of saturation. Okay, that's some examples of the significance of transport processes. Now into the mechanisms involved in, in, in these transport processes. And I have divided this um, part into three levels, so to speak, because they are uh, interacting with each other. Of course, a transport process involves the transport of some species through your pore system. And, and we, we realize that the, the uh, saturation of the pore system is important for, for this. But most transport processes involve also some interaction with the matrix. So being transported in the pore system, something happens between the pore water or pore liquid and the surrounding matrix. Some binding or some fixation of the species being transported. And that will limit the ingress of the species or the leaching out of a species, of course. And it could look like this, where you have transport through the pore system, you have some fixation somewhere, sometimes at the front, and sometimes all the way up to the surface. And that means that the ingress of something into concrete is limited not only by the transport mechanism itself, but also by the fixation of the, uh, the species being transported. So describing and understanding a transport process, you need to understand also the fixation process. And to do that, you need to, to understand the, the relationship between some kind of state of the transported species and the amount bound or fixed in, by the matrix, by the surrounding matrix. And this is what is described with a mass balance equation. And the mass balance equation also involves, of course, a description of the, the transport mechanism itself. You need to identify what are the transport potentials. What is this uh, governing the transport uh, process as such? And lo let's look into this. This is a general way to describe this fixation property, where you have the state of something, the state of the, the, the transported species. It could be water vapor. Uh, it could be uh, the concentration of, in the water, in the poor water of, of an ion. That is the state, so to speak. What is here? is the total amount or the bound amount of that species after interaction or after fix, fixation by the matrix. And describing a transport process, 
this, what I call a binding isotherm, is very decisive for a lot of things. The typical binding isotherm would be the sorption isotherm that Mather showed for water. Then we would have the, um, the vapor content or vapor pressure or maybe the relative humidity here, the state of water. We would have the total moisture content on this scale. And we would have another shape, of course. We would have this S shape. But for instance, for chloride, a binding isotherm would look like this, where you have a much higher binding capacity here. The slope here is much higher when you have a low concentration compared to when you have a high concentration. And this will have an influence on, on the, what the transport poses look like. This is described in a mass balance equation. You could say that you are using this one. This is a mass balance equation. The concentration or the total amount of something being transported at some position will change with time, will change with time. This is the change with time. If there is a difference in the flux of the species to and from this point, and that is what is described here. So this is the typical equation you are using for almost every transport process. And luckily enough, we have something here that has no, no assumptions. And that is absolutely true. But it ends here, because going from here further on to model a transport process, you need a lot of assumptions. But we can at least start with something that is absolutely true. That's, uh, um, that's nice sometimes. We need a lot of assumptions la later on. Oh. OK. Uh, I will go into the different ways to describe these transport processes and uh, what the state para uh, parameters is and uh, the transport potentials are. But I think we should take a, a break, a short break first.